I'm back and welcome to my review for The Fragile Threads of Power by Victoria Schwab. This video is going to contain a lot of spoilers because I need to get some things off my chest. So I will give you a very, very brief synopsis of this book and then I'll jump into everything I thought about what happened in the plot. This is set seven years after the Shades of Magic trilogy and the King of Red London is struggling because magic has disappeared. I mean not necessarily disappeared but there are less children being born with magical gifts than there once were and therefore a lot of the citizens are blaming the royal crown for this lack of magic and a rebellion group called The Hand are beginning to develop so they can take out the crown and in their eyes and what they believe restore magic to Red London. One of the new key characters we follow in this book is called Tess and she is a tinkerer and she fixes little mechanics and machines but she also has the ability to see and manipulate the threads of power so she can see all those threads of magic and how magic makes people and items in this world up and she can therefore play with them and essentially alter the world around her. In my opinion instead of being book one in a new series this should have absolutely been a book four because all of the other perspectives in this book apart from Tess and Kosika in White London who we minimally see from. All of these characters are repeats of the initial trilogy and I was really hoping that they would be all brand spanking new and they were not. I also say that this should be a book four because a lot of the plot hinged on all of these old characters, but then somehow at the same time developed none of them. The point of views of this book jumped around so much and it also skipped in time but didn't give you any warning. So not only were you thrown into the deep end of all of these characters coming back and then not really working together, even though they're supposed to be a solid unit, it was just so busy. It just didn't spend any proper time with them and it felt all over the place. Maybe it was deliberate because the plot to me felt sprinkled in and like we were just getting the surface level of everything Thing. Because it was book one, everything was being held back, so nothing was actually being developed. But this is a whole book in and of itself, so something should have actually been happening that had merit. To me, I felt absolutely zero character connection and emotional connection to this book because everything was just a complete and utter quagmire. What did seem promising was the hand being set up as this rebel group against the crown, and while there were some, you know, significant scenes with the hand, it just felt like everything was scattered and like it wasn't a major focus of the book, even though it was in the synopsis and it should have been a key point of development. It just didn't feel like it had enough weight whatsoever. Instead of focusing on the hand as the rebel group, it's almost like this book took the easy way out as a back door and went, you know, I'm going to focus on Alucard's brother, who is a member of the hand, and he's going to be the villain instead. It was almost like a red herring in terms of setting up the reader to not understand the hand, even though they were functioning in the background. And that felt like a betrayal to me. If you're going to set something up as a key element of your story, why distract me with something that's not as important? There was also a key magical item that Tess had, and I thought that would play a bigger role throughout the story and not just towards the end but Tess was so isolated from everyone else in the book until closer to the end that it didn't feel like it had much significance anyway and she's got the coolest ability out of all of them and so there was so much potential for her character but she just felt really sidelined. These characters too just felt so self-absorbed they just drink a lot of wine and they talk about everything but they don't listen to each other they don't comprehend each other and they just felt flat and self-absorbed I did not have any any emotional connection to the characters and I didn't feel like they had any emotional connection with each other either. They all felt like islands that were faking being a found family because they would talk to each other and then keep secrets and then the other characters would recognize that they weren't sharing everything and they wouldn't check in and see how they were doing like there was no support there and what was an extra kick in the gut to something that I actually enjoyed from the first trilogy was Rai and Alucard's relationship but in this book you get introduced to a queen and Rai had to produce an heir it introduced an element of jealousy and drama to Rai and Alucard's relationship that should not have been present whatsoever. It's like it was just thrown in there to add a little bit of spice to their relationship. And it didn't seem like a necessity to produce an heir. I don't remember the exact details, but I believe someone in the family was adopted. So I thought, why is this happening? It seemed quite undermining, especially to the only relationship in the trilogy and now this book that seemed to have any potential for actual chemistry. It's like, oh no, that can't happen anymore because that was actually functioning so now we need to break it. It was so disappointing. As for the other characters, Kel is still 
absolutely agonizing to read about. Granted, he is grieving his magic, which he's lost, and so he's very emotionally vulnerable. But the one time that he did share his feelings with his romantic partner, she encouraged him to use a knife on himself. So I'm like, oh great, thanks guys. That is perfect fan family. That's so supportive. Even if it was her calling his bluff, it was still so destructive. And I'm like, how are you building this foundation of trust to be in a relationship when the first thing that she suggests when you open up to her is unaliving yourself? That's awful. As a result, Kel across this book continued to just be needy and not address what was going on in his own head. And just becoming Kay seemed so stupid to me. He could have done everything as Kay as Kel. It didn't seem like he needed any segregation of his personality in a way. He needs therapy and support. <laughs> he also emotionally still reads the same age to me as he was in the initial trilogy, but he has aged a lot. So he should be a full adult by now, but he still felt like an absolute child. As a result of this turmoil and it not really being developed properly with enough gravity and communication for the love of God. I wish they would just communicate with each other. He felt stuck in the story and therefore not developed emotionally. And across a story like this, you need emotional development in order for the events in the story to have weight. And that's what was the key element that was missing from this book overall for me. These characters are really good at not asking for help, turning all their feelings inward, in some cases enacting self-harm and also lying to each other to protect each other, which is a trope that I find vital. I hate it so much. Also, I'm still on the bandwagon of completely and utterly hating Delilah Bard. Lila is such a bully. Her arrogance is so annoying. She not only bullied Kel by not listening to him, she also bullied the queen. She impulsively also disappears on her own towards the end of the book. And that is a key part where the characters instead should have worked together as a unit. I find her really entitled and not at all endearing. It's like she was written to be edgy, but it just went way too far in this book. Honestly, it went way too far in the first three books and I just did not like her at all. I just hated her in this one even more. Although she did get beaten up multiple times across this book and I'm glad because somebody had to do it. Lila as a character also surprisingly had more sexual tension with Bex, one of the hands like lackeys, than she has with Kel over the entire trilogy and just with any other character in the book, even a Lucard who I know is not a romantic relationship, but she had more trust with a Lucard in the first three books than she did with Kel at all in any time. So the fact that she had more romantic and sexual tension with Bex and Bex is about to fight and kill her in a battle. I was like, am I reading Lila wrong? The plot just makes Kel and Lila kiss sometimes, but personally I see her as a queer character. For me, she's written as a gay woman, but is portrayed as a heterosexual character. And it feels so un balanced. It's like there's no attraction to Kel, no chemistry whatsoever. But as soon as a interesting and strong character that is a woman comes along, she's suddenly interested. Maybe it's just Lila's fire for the fight. I don't know, but I just do not feel romantic connection from her or interest at all. And granted, I don't really want to invest in her character anyway, because she annoys me. So maybe that's part of it too. The coolest parts of this story to me were Alucard's brother being the villain, even though I talked about it earlier, saying that it felt like a a red herring from what I actually wanted to know being the hand in that organization and the rebel group's plans. It was interesting because Alucard out of all of them is my favorite character. So seeing him get tiny little nuggets across the story felt gratifying to me. It still again just felt fleeting because there were so many other characters and this book almost focused on Kel and Lila and I was hoping that it wouldn't after the trilogy because they've been given enough time. Let's have airtime to the other characters and the new ones especially because Alucard can also see the threads of power and I was expecting a a lot more interaction from him and Tess across this story, but that barely happened. They had like one conversation at the end of the book. So again, there was so much potential there. And I don't know if that potential is being saved for the rest of the books in the series, but I personally will not be reading them. I was just disappointed to see that there was so much lacking in this one that could have made the story that much more interesting in terms of the world building and the beginnings of understanding of why the magic has disappeared. These characters could have done so much together and learned so much from each other, and it just didn't happen. Instead of the world building, building an intrigue coming from, you know, Alucard's magic and the threads of power and magic disappearing. It came from the queen and her studies into magic, which I found was interesting, but I just didn't care about her character. She's just been inserted into this story as a device to tell you about the mechanisms of the world building. And I feel like that could have been executed much more seamlessly through Alucard and Tess. So while I didn't dislike the queen, I just found the mechanism for telling the story and introducing me to additional world building just underwhelming. Since this was marketed as book one of the Fragile Threads of Power instead of book four of the Shades of Magic series, I was really hoping that there would be so much more emphasis on 
Tess as a protagonist because as the main character I was hoping she would bring much more focus to this story. Her and Kosika I was hoping would be the new blood of this story that would take it in a new direction but honestly reading about Kosika as well is so forgettable. She seems just like a dream and almost like a device to bring Holland back as well because she is you know colluding with him and talking to him and I don't know magically how he's managed to come back but it just felt like a cheapskate way for Victoria Schwab to bring back Holland as well even though he's supposed to have died at the end of the last book so it just felt like a whole love letter to the trilogy instead of being something new that was developing new territory. As a result I just could not give less of a hoot about White London, about its politics, about Kosika and her story and her friend like I just do not care whatsoever. I'm fairly confident that my review is in the minority of people because most people give it three four or five stars I'm giving it a two because I was so disappointed. These characters were self-absorbed, impulsive, the racing plot did not build anyone up properly instead it skimmed between each character to kind of touch base but then not do anything with much weight or gravity. At this point usually a magic system would pull me in and interest me but again that was very narrowly developed as well so I was just not invested at all so I am very disappointed to say this book was a two stars and I will not be continuing. I'm glad I tried it because now I know for sure but I probably should have DNF'd it and put it down so yeah let me know what you thought of this book you're probably going to be in the majority as well but I had to film this video to see if anyone else existed that just found this book utterly boring and struggled to get through it like I did. So thank you so much for watching this rant review. Let me know down below what you rated it in the comments. Thank you again so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.